the wonderful city of Derry stroke London Derry. Call it what you will. Either way, it's had a history that's been as turbulent and had as many twists as the river foil that runs through it. And apparently, this is the chap who has put this city on the map. This elderly, infirm man in a white dress. Excuse me. Bah! You don't know an old days, baldy boy. I am Columbus Joe Colum Kill, the famous saint who founded the city 1,500 years ago, just before Walter Loeb was born. <laughs> I chose this spot because of the oak trees that grow here. As a matter of fact, in Irish, the word for oak is Derry. Ooh. In my time, this place was called Derry Column Kill. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. That's not... No, no, I couldn't be. Columbus Monastery grew up around this early settlement. 800 years later, Augustinian monks settled too. Today, the pretty church here is still called St. Augustine's. Here in the grounds of the church lies the grave of little Louisa Coppin. She was the daughter of a ship's captain, and she was also a very sickly child, so she became known by her nickname, Wheezy Coppin. She died in 1849 when she was just four years old. But that wasn't the end of Wheezy Coppin, because for a long time afterwards, her sister still saw her ghost as a blue light around the house. Ooh. But even stranger things were afoot, for at that time, the great explorer, Sir John Franklin, had disappeared while trying to find the fabled yet elusive Northwest Passage. But back home in Derry, Wheezy's spirit provided the breakthrough. In letters three inches high, the names of the stricken ships were spelt out. And on the floor, a chart appeared marking a precise spot in the Arctic seas, the details of which were sent to the distraught Lady Franklin in Liverpool, who immediately dispatched a search party. The place that Wheezy drew was exactly the spot where the ship and the remains of the crew were found. And as a result, Wheezy Coppin, supposed ghost, has her own individual entry in this illustrious work, the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. Yeah, a little girl with some very special powers from Derry. Shh, sorry. You can walk along these great 17th century city walls. They stretch for about a mile around the city and they're 18 feet thick. And they have seen some action because Derry has always been quite vulnerable. Although it's perched on a hill, it's surrounded by higher hills and it doesn't take a genius to work out that it can't be successfully defended from long range shots. <laughs> oh. So Derry became fortified. Building work began in the early 1600s and they made a really good job of it because despite seeing lots of action, these walls are almost perfectly intact, complete with their cannon, some of them dating back to 1590. Now, there was a bit of a scrap here in 1689. It became known as the Great Siege. Nothing great about it, mind you, for the thousands who died. But to understand the background, we need to rewind. <laughs> the Middle Ages were good to Derry. OK, the Vikings came and went, did their customary bit of pillaging and looting, but Derry prospered. But by the 1600s, the English were in Ireland, controlling most of the country, with the exception of Ulster. Feisty Hugh O'Neill and his trusty sidekick Rory O'Donnell were giving the English a hard time, but in 1607, these Irish earls fled to Europe in a failed bid to raise an army, leaving their cohorts back home to fend for themselves. Now, Cahir O'Doherty, the Earl of Inishow, and a big cheese in these parts, wasn't one bit pleased about that. Actually, that's something of an understatement. In fact, he was so brassed off that he burnt the whole place down in 1608. Every last bit of it. New king on the block, James I, decided to sort out those pesky Irish once and for all. So loyal English and Scots were promised huge riches if they came over and settled. Not surprisingly, they came in their droves, eyeing up their prize, the counties of the north. But James had big plans for Derry and he invited the wealthy guilds of London to make something of the charred remains. The body set up to run the new county was the Honourable Irish Society, still going today. The new town was spectacular and was renamed Londonderry in honour of the guildsmen. But problems were just around the corner for James II had come to the throne. He married a Catholic and had converted to his wife's faith. 
the Protestant government back in London weren't one bit happy and encouraged the Dutch prince, William of Orange, to come and seize the throne. James came to Ireland to rally support. James's trusty red shanks, 17th century commandos, came up this very road to the gates at Ferrygate, demanding entry to Derry. But whispers of a Catholic plot to overrun the city had whipped 13 young apprentice boys into action. They seized the keys to the city gates and locked them shut, thus triggering the longest siege in the history of the British Isles. And these very keys can still be seen here in the beautiful surroundings of St. Columns Cathedral. Just what conditions were like behind the walls, it's hard to imagine. Disease, famine, and relentless exploding of mortar shells took their terrible toll. Desperate, people ate rats, dogs, and even corpses, and anyone overweight stayed indoors for fear of ending up as somebody else's dinner. I, myself, was so weak from hunger that I fell under my musket one morning as I was going to the walls. Yet, God gave me strength to continue all night at my post there and enabled me to... Over 5,000 people died, but not John Hunter, the author of the diary. He became a mercenary and went on to fight other battles. The siege lasted 105 days, but the city walls were never breached. In fact, they never have been breached. And that's why Londonderry is known as the Maiden City. But how did the siege end? Well, the answer lies further down the river. So, Ansley, is it true that when the first shots were fired that James actually left the troops to fend for themselves? Yes, James left the city after being fired upon from Bishop's Gate and he left his troops along each side of the river. But they were here primarily to stop any British ships coming up the foil. So this is the very spot where they built the, the barrier or the boom to prevent the ships from coming up the foil? Yeah, just beside us here we have the boom going right across the river to the other side. The boom only lasted a couple of months. Three ships managed to sneak up the river with the infamous Mountjoy breaking through. The siege was over. After the siege, things settled down. It was quite the place to be. The great philosopher, Bishop Barclay, was the Dean of Derry up until 1734. After a near-fatal hunting accident in local woods, John Newton thanked God by writing Amazing Grace. And then there was the popular Earl Bishop Harvey. The Earl Bishop was the first to build a bridge linking the city to the water side. Before that, if you wanted to cross the river, you had to go way upstream to Donald Long Ford or get a boat. And just over here in the water side was the home of the very famous Sir William Beatty. Yes, the surgeon who tended to Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar. That's him over there, mopping Nelson with a handkerchief. But did Nelson ever really say, kiss me hardy? Well, William Beatty from the water side knew. By the 1840s, famine hit Ireland and the people either stayed and starved or left to seek greener pastures in America and Australia. But in fact, the port saved Derry from the very worst of the famine. Indian corn managed to get shipped in. In fact, it actually benefited a few families with a beady business eye. Corn mills sprang up along the banks and fortunes were made for a few. There we go. Single stitch tail hem with a bit of overlocking. I know what I'm talking about. Top quality and it's what you'd expect because Derry has long had a reputation for top notch shirt making. Back in 1831, William Scott realised shirts were becoming high fashion. He and his family began to hand stitch them to order. Soon they were flying off the shelves. 14 years later, he'd employed 250 weavers and 500 shirt makers, and naturally, others followed suit. Uh, some of them not quite as successfully as him. Entrepreneur William Tilly was successful. He arrived from Scotland with 100 sewing machines and set up shop. Soon Tilly's became the biggest shirt factory in the world. Sadly, Tilly's burned to the ground, and with it, one of the few remaining links to Derry's industrial past. In recent years, the city has seen some turbulent times. 
It was central to the civil rights campaigns of the late 60s and suffered greatly in the darkest days of our troubles. But in the new millennium, Derry's future looks bright. The city is being transformed with regeneration and investments. And as for the next thousand years, well, who knows? So, that's your pocket history of Derry. Stroke Londonderry.